Sarah Groves. I'm so excited to have you on For Real. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Kim. See how I didn't get quite through that? (laughs) Okay, before we ask real live questions, I just have to tell you, you are the soundtrack of my life. You have helped me look for so many beautiful things in my life. Following Jesus, you've helped me manage and face hard things in the floodplain. I'm just going to gush for a minute, so just take a break. You have helped me see the joy of setting up pins and knocking them down through entire seasons of motherhood. You helped me find language for legacy in your song about the saints. You reminded me about what it feels like to know new old things and travel and coming alongside new cultures. That was, I saw what I saw. I mean, seriously, I'm a Rolodex of your music. And I just want to thank you. Your song, He's Always Been Faithful to Me, made me cry most recently yesterday in the car. So Mm -hmm. I'm telling you over decades, Sarah Groves, your work has mattered so much to me. So Before we say another word, I just want to thank you for doing that for so many years for me. Thank you. Just for you. It was just for me and your mom. (laughs) Um, Okay, so let's just talk. I'm just going to dive right in. I have so many questions. I won't get to all of them. But number one, you love language. In fact, I'm pretty sure you were an English teacher. Is that correct? I was, yeah. I was just reading something about... um, it it was talking about me as a former teacher. And I thought, that's so funny. I taught for three years. I've been a singer songwriter for 25 years, but that the way you introduce yourself to the world is totally very permanent. Yeah. (laughs) But yes, first bullet point was English teacher. And so I would love to ask you about the process. I'm going straight to process. Yeah. The process of combining text and language that you love with chords and melody how does that work and who, what wins? Do you often go text first or melody first, or how does it work in your brain? Uh, well, in a nutshell, text and melody usually come together for me. Okay. Um, like a, an idea usually comes with its own music when I hear it or whatever. Uh, if I start a melody and I don't have any music or language for it, um, lyrics for it, that doesn't tend to get finished. So I would say I would lean more the the lyric and what I'm trying to convey has always been kind of what gets me out of bed. Okay. Um, I I I like to name things and explain things that I'm feeling mm. that I've experienced to try to find the just right. What was that? You know, yeah. we we were standing on opposite sides of the island. We were in a fight and I saw you literally disappear within yourself. And I felt myself withdraw within myself. But I think the boy that loves me is in there. And I think the girl that loves you is still in here. And so, you know, so it's me, a lot of times I'm like working in with my own life. I don't always write about myself. I'm also writing about other people. People tend to think all my relationship songs are about Troy, poor guy, but right. they're not all about Troy. Um, yeah, so I would say they come together, but I've tried to unpack this for years. I really love songwriting as a craft. I would say I didn't start out, it was very innate to me. I was writing very young and it was very emotional. It was cathartic. It was a valve release for me. Um, and it wasn't until maybe all right here i remember going to a songwriter workshop i was speaking at the shop workshop and i'd been very much like this is what god gave me you know this is what i this is what i felt you know or or sensed about something and this uh pierce pettis is a a singer songwriter um beautifully accomplished singer songwriter and i he was talking about songwriting and I realized, oh, this is a craft with rules. And I don't know, I don't really, I haven't really respected, I guess, the history of it, you know? And so I've spent since then just trying to figure out what is happening when I'm writing a song, (laughs) how does that come about? So I have a lot of thoughts on it and I teach on songwriting a lot um, that have come together over the years, but it's, yes, somewhat a mystery. Somewhat of a mystery. So fascinating to me as a writer, because I, there are some parallels in my experience as well. And we talk to a lot of writers who have, you know, there are lots of ways to do what we do and what you do. And so it's so fascinating that you also started shooting from the hip 
I think there's a natural inclination to write Mm -hmm. a song or to write a story. And a lot of what comes out, particularly at first, is just, as you said, innate. It's just kind Mm -hmm. of built in. And the longer I do this, and it sounds like the longer you do this, the greater your respect grows for some of that scaffolding that other people have used, even if you didn't know it to begin with. Yeah, I think I was doing some of it it, without knowing it because I liked music. I was listening to music. I was imitating what I liked, but I wasn't really fully aware. And there were problems with it. Yes. And so there were things that I thought that I didn't, I I wanted to not just get better at at as a craft, but even as like spiritual expression and what's what again in naming what's actually going on you have to tell yourself the truth and i realized over all this time that it is very hard to tell yourself the truth and i'm often i will have written a song i'll be out playing it it has been recorded it's been mixed i've been talking about it i've been telling people what it's about and i will be mid-concert and realize oh this song is about this other thing no way and it'll be something very knotted up inside me you know if that makes sense and i'll be singing about it and realize oh that's my sadness about that friendship or that whatever or that way i felt you know so outside of all of you know that that experience or whatever and i'll just feel this loosening like oh i was and it's unbelievable how many times I've done that, how many times I've written about my own life before I was, you know, front door aware of it. It's just it's all in there because it's all happening. You know, we're just so much of us. We're in survival mode and then we're we're beset with. Um, well, that's a whole other conversation if you want to get into that. <laughs> yes, let's go. You go. <laughs> no, well, I think you're touching on some beautiful things that we yeah. and actually, I think what you're saying is part of why I've loved you for so many years, because you, you are unflinching in your willingness to talk about the argument at the, at the kitchen Island, and then to unravel what that means afterward. Right. So it's not just a one-off with you. You haven't just had one conversation about conflict and then we have a neat and tidy bow. I think that, and we're, we're the same age. And so that Mm -hmm. has tracked with me where you are going. I am there. Yeah, But this idea that it has multiple layers is very interesting because that the same thing happens with writing in long form. So talk to yes. me more about that. Well, as a person of faith, I think that we come with a lot of scripts. So I've got a few ways of describing this. One is the directive. And that's from the movie WALL-E where um, Eva comes, you know, you know, the movie WALL-E. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes. So she... Eva comes and she's has, she has a directive to find, you know, life, find this triggered by a green plant or whatever. They're getting to know each other. They're spinning around and, you know, having dancing to these songs and getting getting familiar with each other in a very like in a human way. As soon as Eva hits this, finds her directive, she shuts down she turns into something else um she literally closes off if you look at what wally is doing he's trying to hold her hand he's trying to pull her fingers out to hold her hand he has an umbrella over her he has her draped in lights i found a lot of my christian um I, i had a lot of directives inside me so i would be getting to know someone as a person or a situation or learning about something and if i tripped over one of my directives I would shut in, go into this must, you know, must give the Romans road or, you know, must do the, <laughs> must bring I like up the robotic choreography as yes. well. It's a good touch. Yeah. Right. I would shift into the this place that. mm-hmm. that's not really human anymore. Uh, it's very, um, and that, that image just really moves me mm. that, I just think we're supposed to be, and I don't know like the difference, the roles like uh, of what, like a pastor or, but as an artist, I see in the Psalms, a really huge invitation really to just bear witness. So Charlie Peacock did a lot of helping me and talking to me about how much I was editing myself. And I Uh think in the early, early days, I have this wrestle with what I feel my role is as a sort of music missionary. And then my role as a as a songwriter to reflect what I see and to tell the truth about what 
I'm experiencing. And I've just learned over the course of this time that almost not all, I will say every time, the, the more truthful I am about just what's going on and how I feel about it and what is happening. Like there's something about humanity and humanness that Jesus comes to be acquainted with. It's, it's valuable. We do a lot of that elevating of the divinity and this, you know, that Gnostic, Gnosticism, that, that bent towards the spirit and the real world and our real lives are, you know, uh, suppressed. A that's bit not, yeah, that's down. not the stuff that we're really, that's not, yeah, that's not important. It's not like what's, and I think we're called to bear witness. Mm -hmm. And I think if we only bear witness to one part, like the exuberant praise or the, you know, extraordinary or the positive, we, we lose credibility. I think that the whole point is sort of bearing witness. And, and I see that in the Psalm, Psalm 72 is one of my favorite and it came to me at a time where I really needed it. And Asaph basically says, the wicked look pretty happy to me all day long. Their, their houses are growing, their families are growing. They seem to be abundant in wealth. I wash my hands every day, all day long to be pure, to do the right things, to keep in line. And all I get is a punch in the face, you know? And then he's, like, I feel like a brute beast before you. But that psalm ends with, he goes into the sanctuary. He sees something about the nature of following God and bringing God way into his life or not following God. And he walks out of the sanctuary saying, who have I in heaven but you? There's nothing I desire more than you. My heart and my strength forever they fail me, but you are my portion. You know, I will tell everyone it's good to be with God. So I think if you don't say the wicked look pretty happy to me, um, and yeah, so anyway, that's the journey, right? That the journey is trying to, trying to tell the truth. And these days I feel, um, yeah, that that's just a less and less of a conflict for me because I, I feel like I've, ironically enough, when I had more of a microphone and more of a place in the center of th things or, you know, in that, whatever my arc of career, you know, now I feel like I have found my voice mm. in a time when I'm a little bit more, you know what I mean? Mm. And that's just interesting to me to even seek out other artists who are maybe not in the middle of things, but what have you learned? Mm, <laughs> Please come right. tell me what you've learned. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I love what you had to say about the the psalm. I don't think that we would appreciate the sanctuary moment if we don't have the, the wicked look pretty good to me. If you start with everything's fantastic, I see nothing wrong here. No one in my life will listen to me. I won't even listen to me. If yeah. I just go to the, this is how it's all cleaned up. God, everything's great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I have those moments, but frequently I do not. Frequently I begin yeah. with, why is everything around me not making sense? This is a nonsensical situation. God, yeah. let's talk about that. Um, I've even noticed in my recent prayer life, if I start talking to God, like we're in the middle of a conversation, which is kind of what Asaph did, right? Mm -hmm. Why is this wrong? <laughs> I'm stressed out about this. This is not working. Instead of, as you say, all these scripts that I've learned growing up, mm -hmm. these pretty words I put first that make me feel like now I'm praying. Yeah. I feel like that's actually a speed bump <laughs> to get it to where I really need to be. Um, and where real honesty happens and where really good things happen. So I love that, that you're talking about that. And I love it that you're looking for people who've already been down that road a little bit, learning from them. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there are a couple songwriting advice things that, you know, got from Charlie Peacock and other people in my life that, but that was one, he just told me, don't edit yourself. Mm -hmm. Try as hard as you can to not edit. And, and I realized that I was starting with this question and I say this a lot to new songwriters. If you start with a question, well, what's the faithful thing to say? Uh, that's going to lead you in a place that's just very masked and sometimes very performative. Mm -hmm. And I'll often have someone share, you know, the lyrics for a new song and it's kind of in this esoteric realm of like the faithful things to say, then they'll tell me the story behind the song afterwards. And I think, okay, no, all that stuff has got to get in this song, right. you know, this song needs to be called 
like you got to get the word Chattanooga in there. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> if something happens in Chattanooga, that's got to get into the song. But just those personal things like that are, um, yeah, that that's to me, that's the journey. And still, I think like you, any writer probably feels this way. But again, what gets me out of bed is I want to write a better song than I've mm -hmm ever written, you know, or, or keep naming. There's just no end to it. There's no end to naming mm. the stuff you feel. And you've said, and I appreciate your, your, uh, it, words of encouragement to me. And, and, uh, when I started this, I was, I was embarrassed. That would, that would, that would be the word like that would encapsulate <laughs> my first handful of years. Really? I, I, I felt both like I'm supposed to do this. I think I'm supposed to do this, but I was very embarrassed a lot. And my husband was more the activator. He is still the, uh, he's an activator. And so, but I remember crossing a bridge in my car driving and thinking, why would I do this? This feels very, just, it just felt very embarrassing to go become a troubadour after I had a degree and I was a teacher and, you know, and I remember feeling like um, that, that God was speaking to my heart that it's not a competition. There are enough ears, first of all. Um, and it felt like he said, not everyone's going to get what you're doing, but there will be some people who you will be their songwriter. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean like I'm their only songwriter, but what a, what an amazing mm -hmm. gift and, and privilege to, as I process my life. So when I wrote the song Signal about my kids, um, you know, launching and getting their la their lives starting. I, I hear the signal. I hear your radio station. I'm tuning in and it's getting louder and I, I love it. And I just want to cheer you on that you're, I hear you. And it's, it's not cliche, like go do it, keep getting louder. So that's me with the, you know, a, a, a junior higher graduating, going to high school, you know? So I feel like now, even in this place in my life, what, what's happening to me that, that, people could use language for, you know, or that I could use language for. It always starts kind of there first and then, yeah, and then goes out from there. What a, what a gift. So the more, the more uh, honest I am and the better I am at naming actually my real life, then, then that's going to be just way more like we're, we're friends, right? <laughs> Can I tell you that right. this is hard or that this is the real deal? And I think yeah. that's just a better place to, to sort of, yeah. To, to begin from versus what is the faithful thing to say? Yeah. Right. So good. I wonder, I wonder as you're talking, I'm just wondering if that's a faith unique situation, because I do see that a lot that we, um, I talk with a lot of writers and in my own writing, but you said that, you know, you go to the faithful spot, like kind of the takeaway, right? What did, what do I know that I'm supposed to know? And you don't go to Chattanooga first because Chattanooga feels a almost a little ornery or um, disrespectful. Like before I knew this, we won't talk about that part. We'll talk yeah. just about kind of the landing space. Um, and I feel like we really cheat ourselves. Not, I, I like to think about writing as taking out the zoom lens and we don't, we don't, no one wants to write, read a chapter about you know, just bullet point after bullet point of all the wisdom you've had. But if you can start at the kitchen table in Chattanooga, when things were not going okay, and how you got to that, then I'm in. And I think you do that with your with I know you do that with your songwriting, you help me come sit at the table with you. If you just say here is everything that I've ever known, I'm going to give you four lines of text, I cannot identify with that. And so you have done such a good job over and over, um, album after album in all the seasons of your life. And I have a question about that yeah. because this requires a level of honesty, as you've mentioned, and not just for you, but for your family. So, um, you are able to open these spaces to us and we feel like we know you. I asked my daughter, actually, I have a daughter that's the same age as yours. And I asked her if she had any questions for you because we play a lot of Sarah Gross. And she said, why don't you ask her about her weirdest encounter with a fan? And then she paused and said, not including you. <laughs> because she knows <laughs> that I've met you before and cried my eyeballs out. And so I we giggled about that. But I'm actually wondering about, don't answer that first question. We don't want to out all the people like me who weep uncontrollably when we meet people we admire. But I am wondering about how you navigate that dynamic with your listeners mm -hmm. and with your family, right? Because you are 
this is a public situation and a private situation. Yeah. So fans probably feel like they know you because of the nature of your work. And yet you're also building a home and you have three kids. So how does that work? Yeah. Um, the, the listener part, I like the word listener. I don't use the word fans. Oh, There's, okay. No, it's not. You're, you're allowed. Because I am. Oh, I mean, yeah. listen, I, I, <laughs> you, I'll, you, that's totally, I would, uh, it's a framing, framing for me, I guess. Totally. I uh, get it. I get it. Because I think we're all in this weird, we're just in a weird, our culture is just unhinged around like who sort of like, you know, has th those kind of hierarchies or not just yeah. hierarchies, but of like, yeah, that sort of like, cause an artist's life is so weirdly, um, it is so smoke and mirrors. I remember being mm -hmm. at one of the most famous theaters in, I was in New York or somewhere. I can't remember. We were in a big theater and the dressing rooms for, they, they were telling us like Judy Garland was here and Sammy yeah. Davis Jr. or whatever. And it's like, it's like there's a single light bulb <laughs> and a and a sink hanging off the wall. It looks like an interrogation room. That's where the talent goes. Right. Yeah, and that has changed the green room. That's a story you could write sometime. Green okay. rooms at churches is a story you could write. But oh, I want to talk about um, that. Yeah, but just like dressing rooms, I guess right. you know, like. But here, I'm, I'm like at one of the prestigious, you know, theaters and and really famous people have gone before me and they're hiding out in this little rat hole before right. they come up on stage and all the lights come on yeah. and they've got their makeup. So that whole thing is just already kind of, it's a weird deal. And that's so, a metaphor for now too, right? Now yeah. our, our green rooms are our family rooms and then Instagram looks real great. So we're perpetuating that on a, yes. on a micro oh, level yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. Every single person is mm -hmm. doing that now. Yeah. So it's weird. And so you have to like, all right, what's true about us, you know, and what's, what's real about you and I, and we are relative strangers, you know, but um, I always appreciated, I think because one of the greatest gifts of, of this job has been getting to see so many places and, and churches specifically. I've been to every kind of church you can imagine. Huge, massive, small, you know, every denominationally diverse, you know, um, Protestant, Catholic. I've been so many places. And because I'm coming in with music, the, the assumptions about me are generous. Mm -hmm. um, I think people will, they have a song that they resonated with. They think, I love this song. You and I must think alike. Like, that's just how it must be. I can't possibly think alike all the people I've been in community with. So when I walk in, the, the assumptions about me are generous. It's not coming in through a political or doctrinal door. I'm coming in mm -hmm. through this lens of music. And then I get to have these really human conversations with people. Um, and I've always appreciated that. I've always mm -hmm. felt like there's something to that that's, there's a key in there to even some of what we're doing right now and how we might be able to see each other and uh, speak to ideas, but without denigrating each other. Anyway, that got off into the weeds there, Kim. No, but that's good. No, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm right in the weeds <laughs> with you. So, oh, you. But you were saying like, li oh, listeners, and that what this is an ecosystem. I don't get to do what I'm doing without people listening. So, mm -hmm. I'm highly aware of that. You know, and these days I feel like I get to go around and meet all those people for whom I was their songwriter or I was one of their songwriters. So that's been just a a huge joy. Michael Card overheard me early on after a show. I was ripping myself to shreds. Every person that gave me a compliment, I had a I had something negative to say yeah. about myself. Yeah. Wow. And he said basically like, oh honey, you're not gonna that's not gonna work. And he he said you are a co how did he put it we are co-participants you know like you just got the song first and then share it and other you know but you we all get to say like oh my word look what god is doing in us look what he does isn't that like that's that's fun that's amazing and you can are co-celebrators of what god does in us so um yeah i think that helped immensely 
for me to be able to frame what was happening there when someone was trying to tell me something positive about what the music had meant to them. Mm. Oh, what a great uh, picture of an ecosystem. I love that word. I'm using it and stealing it. Yeah. That it's collaborative. Every part of it is collaborative. Every part of it. And how about the collaboration with your family? You mentioned Troy, who is a percussionist, as I remember. I've heard him play, right? Yeah, he did. He was on the road with me. He was my manager and percussionist for 17 years, and then he took a job with IJM. Okay, International Justice Mission. Mm -hmm. Um, And you're... I have so many questions about that that we'll save for another time about how you work with your spouse and how that works in, in a co- collaborative, creative experience. Uh, that's amazing to me. I married a physics major who's a wonderful man. And I know a hundred percent of the time I need to show him a finished draft. He's not my ref draft reader because he's a nuts and bolts person. So when yeah. I'm like, tell me about the, how, what's this development of this idea? He'll be like, well, she was wearing a red shirt and now she's wearing a blue shirt. Yeah. That's actually not what I'm asking. <laughs> so, so I am so in awe of two creatives in one house having to um, make this happen. You yeah. can say as much or as little as you want about that. And I do want to know about <laughs> your kids, how you've been able, because I feel like you've paved the way in a lot of ways over over, I mean, when we started, when you started, when I started in these different spheres, you could just put out your music. I could put out a book and no one would talk to me for a really long time until the next thing. And now there's like this yeah. constant conversation, including my family. So teach yeah. me, yeah. Sage, how you do this. Uh, I don't know, Kim. I mean, I think that it's so raising children is such a humbling experience. And I feel like a lot of times, again, the people that have the mic are so young and uninformed. Oh boy, that's the truth. (laughs) As was I, I was out there saying stuff. And I think now, ah, give it back. What was I I talking about? And no business talking about parenting. Parenting adult children is not for the faint of heart. Um, So there are these like, layers and layers of experience i think that we don't really want to hear maybe our value because it's on the it's hard and we want to know it's easier when the kids are at that age where you tell them to go sit down and they go sit down or they might throw a little fit or whatever well right (laughs) whoop-de-doo but ice cream will fix it mostly ice cream yes yeah Yeah. so we're not in that anymore Yeah. So that, I think that I don't have any answers. I do know that I made some choices and I see other people in my life who made other choices. So one big one was I was not highly sensorial. My mom wasn't either with me. Troy's mom was more with him. So I think you make a choice when you have kids. I'm going to, I'm going to protect in sort of like, I'm going to, now this is pre-internet even when I say this idea, but obviously we do protect our children from like all that's out there. But in my mind, I I wasn't going to say you're not going to read these things or I'm not going to. It's like more of like, a all right, kids, this is the world we're in. Let's go. Let's go learn about it while you're here with me. And I'm going to say we're going to go look at at all the things that as they come up. Right. And we're going to talk about them, hopefully transparently. And right. so that was more my that was what my mom had done that I felt like was she saw me as an adult in the making. She didn't see me as a child that was sort of like, and she always saw that my ideas had value, my opinions, you know, were welcome into the mm-hmm. the dialogue in the family. So that was a choice I made. I see different people in my family making different choices. I told Troy, even like some, some people in our lives that we really have big disagreements with, um, but I look in at them and I say, they're wanting to protect their children. They're just trying to do right by their right. family. And in this crazy world, they're trying to make sense. I have another friend is like every single thing that goes into her mouth and her children's mouths, like she's highly, highly regulating everything, all those things. And I think that's her responding to this totally. crazy world and yes. saying, I'm going to, so I'm not doing that, but what am I doing? You know, I, I did say, we got to go right to the front line. We got to find the guys that are like, if this human traffic thing is happening, Mm -hmm. where are the people? And I got to go find them because when, you know, everyone has their, their, uh, I don't know, their response to the craziness of the world. Mm -hmm. And, and then that intrinsic desire to, to love your family well and see your kids to the other side, you know, of their 
into adulthood. So mm. yeah, Troy and I were pretty like, this is the world. What's the Frederick Buechner? I think there's a good quote that he has, like, here's the world. It's wonderful and terrible. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid or something like that. Um, that was more our mode. It was like, we're going to just see it. What's going, what's going on. All right, let's talk about it. And, mm. and not, not as censoring, you know, everything. Um, but those are all choices. I, I look at some of my friends who did highly censor and, you know, their, their kids were afforded. I don't know. Some of them right. did really well in that. And some of them, their kids just were like, why didn't you tell me? Yeah, right. <laughs> so this was waiting even, for me. Yeah. Even the kids have different responses right. to being raised that way or another way. So I'm kind of, yeah, summing up that I don't know much. <laughs> Same. Same. You were also doing this and have <clears throat> done this in a, in the eye of the public. And so how does that switch? So for example, when you're learning these things and talk, we, we have a similar mojo here at our house. So, mm -hmm. um, and again, jury's out, right? I, we're just doing the best we can. And we've definitely talked about all the things. And sometimes I leave the conversation and think, was that protecting or, <laughs> or did I say too much? You know, we just don't know. But I wonder about how, like the interplay of that with what you're learning in your life. And then you write a song about it. Yeah. or you talk about it publicly or yeah. you post about it. How mm. is that interchange with your family and your work? I think it's pretty, It. I think it does inhibit me quite a bit um, in like I see other uh, writers, especially now you are writing longer form sentences. So the story has to have some details or right. uh, whereas a three minute song, you, you can you lean into poetic wow. language and okay. you can sort of express. So I'm, I'm telling all kinds of things on myself and on other people in my songs, you know, um, there are parts of when it was over the song, when it was over and they could talk about it and they were sitting on the couch. Um, you know, there were times when I would say that the couple on the couch are these people. And then there are times when I'd say, no, the couple on the couch are Troy and I. Mm -hmm. um, so th there's like, it's not always about me personally. Right. And that's part of like just writing or being, a, you know, entering into that naming process mm -hmm. of like, well, what is this common human experience that I want to name? Right. Um, and then maybe not even being restricted by the real story to say, all right, what is that thing I'm trying to, yeah, I'm yeah. trying to name. But I think that Troy was very generous about in this regard. The very first song that I wrote about our marriage that was really hard was Roll to the Middle. Mm. And it was to just a full on true story. We, he was getting ready to leave the country and he made a comment. So I'm not always the most organized of us. He's more detail, you know, he's going to be more aware and I'm maybe just stereotypically um, daydreamy, you know, can not always keep track of things, whatever. And I had left the oven on that week or something. And he sat me down to like very talk down to me about, you know, I'm going to need to, you Turn know, off the oven when he's out of the country. Yeah. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and anyway, and it went from there and I just like, yeah. wait a minute, I might forget to turn on, you know, I might have some moments like that he also has, you know, I might for lose my wallet, but I'm not ir an irresponsible person, you know? So I, we went zero to 60 in this conversation yeah. and he was actually also like backpedaling. I mean, it was like, he hit a nerve and, and so, and I tended just like, what? <laughs> Right. So, yeah, anyway, and I was mad. I was hurt or whatever. And he, so we, but he's getting ready to leave town. I think I can't leave on this note, you know, right. so I have these two parts of myself that are like, I'm really mad and want to hold on to that for a really long time. And, and you're leaving town and I can't let you go away for three weeks without us having some sort of, you know, so I went and wrote the song rolled to the middle as like emergency <laughs> wow. repair needed, you know, it to name really quickly what had just happened, you know, and that regardless of what the fight was about, when you withdraw from me like this, that's the worst, mm -hmm. regardless of what we're fighting about. Like mm -hmm. I still have points to make and you still have your points to make, but when you're, when you are withdrawing yourself from me, that is just unbearable. That's very hard. So, I'm going to not withdraw myself from you, even though we just had this fight, I'm going to turn towards you. And even when that feels hard and, uh, and anyway, I don't always do that, but in this moment, it helped us through. And he was, he got on a plane and went overseas and we were 
it helped us big time in that moment. So anyway, so he said, sorry, Kim, I'm all over the You're place. You're doing so I great. Give, I want all of it. Keep I going. I the longest. <laughs> that was so well, great. To your question, when I played that demo for Troy, I but but of course this will never go on the record, you know, because I talk about like rolling to Us. the middle. Yeah, yeah. And like whatever. And so then Troy was the one who said this absolutely needs to be on a record. I don't think, I think most everybody will understand what this mm. is. So he encouraged me early on to, no, go ahead, tell, tell about us, you know, and um, talk about stuff. And I really appreciate that he did that um, because it really just set me free. Then even when I'm writing about other people, you think right. everyone's going to know. And no, most, no one, I've had, I've written songs about people where it's like, this is about you. And this thing, like, I'm really frustrated with you. And this is like, whatever. And that person will come to talk to me about that song and be like, can you believe, isn't that so much oh. like this other person? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, okay. You know, and you so don't need, correct. You just say, no, yeah, no. yeah, no, I can't believe it. Mm -hmm. No, no need. Yeah. Totally. Oh my goodness. That's hilarious. I thought only novelists had that happen. Uh, many times in my life, yeah. people have said, oh, that character. And I'm thinking, that's you. <laughs> but you don't know. <laughs> so awesome. Oh, my God. Okay. I'd love to talk with you about another. There was a time when I heard you, um, you gave a Christmas concert. We have your Christmas albums. Everyone listening, go buy everything Sarah has ever made in <laughs> her life. And absolutely required every you have two right christmas albums mm -hmm. oh, i hope it's only two because those are yes. about beaten dead at our house we listen <laughs> to them all the time i love them so much and you were on i think the oh holy night tour mm -hmm. and i heard you talk about i think this was that concert you talked about anxiety you mm -hmm. talked about having stage fright and anxiety and it was a very new thing to you and alarming to you and i remember mm -hmm. sitting in the pew I predictably cried through the entire concert. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this woman is just relentless in telling the truth. And you had not, there was no bow at the end of that story. You didn't say, and now I've figured out my coping mechanisms and it's going like this. You were right smack dab in the middle yeah. of dealing with that. And I would love for you to talk to me a little bit. I've never heard you talk about it again. Maybe you have, but how did, how did that go? Because that was yeah. part of your life prior to that, right? Yeah. This was 2000, a new thing. In 2008, I had a panic attack on stage. I say stage. It was, I was at a prayer breakfast for an insurance company. It oh was in town. You know, I'd just been hired to do music as a part of this event. Very benign event. No reason to be nervous. Nothing really spectacular happening. And I started playing add to the beauty and I was just overtaken. And I, the way I describe it is as if, um, like now I know that it was my fear response was just, you know, as if a bear walked into the room, you know, um, or, or if like the highest, you know, flight <laughs> feelings that you can have if you were confronted with something terrible. So I knew right away something was wrong because it was so, I'd had, you know, probably really realistically, I'd had generalized anxiety for some time, but mm. um, this is the first time I ever had a panic attack. And because it happened on stage that marked that place. So mm. when I, I went to get help right away, because I, I, uh, oh, it was just, it was unreal. And it, mm. and so my choices then are to quit even right then that morning, I, I'm thinking I have to run out of this room and never come back. Uh, I have to tell them I'm having a heart attack. I knew I wasn't having a heart attack. Um, I could tell this is like fear at the highest levels mm. I've ever experienced fear. It's just- Was it your body? How did you know this? It was all internal, your body did something. How did you know this is happening? Well, so if you're, I mean, what do you feel like when you're afraid? I um, wanna run out of the room, yeah. Or or if someone- like heart's racing. The discomfort of fear is yeah. like, it's it's an adrenaline dump it's yes. a bucket of adrenaline um there's a lot of things that come with it i think learning I, I so i had someone in my life have someone in my life who had dealt with depression on a pretty clinical level all their life and because of their 
realm of the, the denomination I was growing up in because of it had really been assigned to a spiritual, it was a spiritual problem and it had been deemed a, a spiritual, you know, that was a, that space. So I knew right away, I want to get help from someone who can tell me what's going on with my body. Cause it was yes. so physical. It was so physical. Right. I would just, I'd wake up in the middle of the night with another, you know, just another round of it and um, just a bucket of adrenaline dumped. And then, um, so the, there's two parts, there's the anxiety and that, that I, I was, I thought I'm not going to quit because of this. I'm going to keep going. And that, you know, those are the stories that a lot of people, I mean, I've talked about a little bit more, so maybe people do know, but I think we just don't know, you know, how hard people are working to do what they do and, you know, to show up. And so for a good year there, it was, it was brutal to walk out on stage. Mm -hmm. And I remember Dr. Ann telling me, um, had you been crossing a bridge and this happened, like this was going to happen at some point. And had you been crossing a bridge, you'd be afraid of bridges. If you'd been flying, you'd be afraid of flying. Okay. If you had been, so that helped me understand. She helped me so much mm. understand what was happening to my body physically, what would, would and would not happen. So you actually, you feel like sometimes you're going to pass out. You will not pass out. It's actually opening all the vessels. It's mm. not closing anything. So there's certain things that you're afraid of are going to happen that just, you know, and then a lot of it was just, you know, radical acceptance of, okay, so my leg is shaking. Like, are people leaving the room? Are they asking for their money back? Is this the end of the world? You know, and you learn to, you basically, and, and I did create new pathways in my brain, mm. you know? So that kind of stuff alongside the spiritual conversation has been something I've explored for a long time because for me, I had to, I, my, the people and friends in my life who were saying like, you need to just, you know, claim this and take this, whatever. I, there was nothing I could say to certain spheres enough to say like, no one is praying more than I'm praying. No one is believing more than I'm believing. I want out of this more than anyone I know. Um, and not just out, like, I want to learn what I'm supposed to learn, like all the faithful things you think I'm not doing or so, and somehow not, not taking hold of. So that was the next part of the journey. So what happened with that anxiety is, uh, and, and for a series of reasons, I started right away. Someone told me you need to go get a physical mm -hmm. because sometimes when something's wrong with your body, your, your system, uh, the, that, that. So I'm, I'm not thinking about that, you know, that system that senses all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. It picks up before you might even be uh, right. You know, again, in the front door, you're not aware, but yeah. so I went in and got a full physical and it turns out I had some, I had a congenital heart mm. condition. I had some things going on physically that I then was able to begin addressing. And wow. so we just don't know. Right. We don't understand mental health and right. depression and all these things. But I started to have in that was 2008. And I really got a hold of that and getting back out on stage and like, all right. And, and for me, it was important to my kids. Like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to quit. One wow. of the, the the pinnacle of this, I was invited to sing at the White House. And my I just kids had a rush of adrenaline when you said that out loud. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you're in the middle of figuring this out at that time. Yes. And Michael Weir was at the White House working with Obama in his faith initiative. You know, President Obama was doing a lot of um, trying to, you know, he had been obviously labeled and people had, you know, thoughts about his faith. And um, and so Michael Weir was saying, um, you know, President Obama's own testimony uh, is very, you know, is about Jesus Christ. And this is his story, you know, as he tells it, you know, so they were doing an Easter uh, thing and they invited a lot of evangelicals and it was really broadly, actually it was pretty broadly ecumenical. Mm -hmm. And they, Michael had heard the song, he's always been faithful and, and liked that I sang it and then invited other people to sing a piece of greatest mm -hmm. thy faithfulness and thought most, most people in the room will know this song. So we won't have to have lyrics up and that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. But I remember being in the hotel room before we went over and um, and I, I thought I can't go. My kids were in the room. We're all in a hotel room together and I'm on the phone with my mom and all my cheerleaders, you know, 
And I just thought, I felt like I'm supposed to do this in front of them. Mm-hmm. I just am supposed to show them this whole process, the whole thing. So I'm freaking out. I'm not calm. I'm just like, I'm, whew, yeah. this is going to be hard. I'm really, I'm, this is going to be, I'm, I'm scared about this. This is like, wow. And a funny thing I had identified that a lot of the churches I go to these really big personalities, but especially these like really accomplished men where you, I don't know, it's just, it was a big trigger for me as a, maybe as a woman, I don't know, but this sort of like this, this whole church is built on like success and whatever. And now you go out there and you wow them. And I would just like, you know, something like that. Like, so powerful men (laughs) were a trigger for me. Yeah. I would get around certain personalities and it was just like, I can't with you. Right. (laughs) Right. And you're headed to the white house and I'm headed to the white house. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So I told my kids, I said, I said, you see me freaking out right now. And tomorrow when I pick you up, you're going to hear me say about how God was with me, how I was able to make it through. So you watch, you watch this whole thing, Mm -hmm. you know, and not just that, I'm also leaning on my like breathing. (laughs) Right. (laughs) And my, all you know, the tools. all yep. the tools, like watch me learn how to live in my body. You watch me learn how to live in my body and still, and not quit. So that became, that became really important to me that my kids see me now. They've also heard all the, yeah, all the behind the scenes of like, it's not, it's not easy stuff, you know, but, yeah. but compared to other people, I mean, good Lord. So I just decided I wasn't going to quit because of it. In 2013, I started having insomnia. That was a different kind of manifestation of it in that it, I was waking up in the middle of the night and then not be able to go to sleep. Yeah. And I did that for three months and it was very, very depressed. Um, you can't have insomnia for three months and yeah. not at that level. I was getting, you know, maybe no sleep, two hours a night, maybe. No, ma'am. And I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. Mm-hmm. It was awful. And, um, and I was just in a really bad, bad way, um, bad condition. And we'd been going pretty hard. There were a lot of factors, you know, and uh, this is when Troy's beginning to maybe make a shift away from being my manager. So there's a lot of interpersonal dynamics. There's a lot of work things and raising children, all of it that's that's involved. Um, but I remember being down uh, at, I was running along the Mississippi River trying to get endorphins going and trying to, you know, again, a lot of good advice about what I should be eating and thinking and, you know, how I should be praying. And I realized I still had, even though I'd been talking about my anxiety, I had a lot of shame around Mm. depression and that I believed for other people that medicine was okay, you know, Mm. but, um, or, or these certain, you know, whatever pathways were okay. But I, for myself, you know, I, I felt like I, what I was carrying a lot of shame about it. And, um, so I was running along the Mississippi and I saw, um, that there was a man set up on the waterfront, a homeless man in a tent. And my first thought was, um, well, I knew he probably deals with mental health stuff because our our neighborhood we have a lot of people experiencing homelessness and you know, a lot of the services for homeless uh, people experiencing homelessness are here so i thought he's probably you know i'm just wondering about his life and what he's been up against and um and i also thought that's like you're but look at you camping on the like the banks of the mississippi river that's some huck finn stuff right there you're like people pay a lot of money to get waterfront property and you're i hope you're just able to enjoy yourself for a minute, you know, and then I looked up and on the on my uh, St. Paul's built on a bluff and to my right was the James J. Hill house up on the top of the bluff and James J. Hill was a railroad baron and successful. And so I'm running and thinking about these two dynamics. And I had heard a story about the immigrants that they when they came to Minnesota, they had built on the on the floodplain and uh, then they had um, you know, moved up like Mama Mancini had lost a baby in one of the floods, the the waters would flood and they'd lose everything that they built. And so 
she started selling spaghetti and, you know, established Mancini's restaurant, which is still on seventh and it's kind of like wow. halfway up the bluff, you know? So I'm thinking like, how do I need to start making spaghetti? How do I make spaghetti? <laughs> and, you know, I'm starting to see myself, this as a metaphor, you know, about where I'm, where I'm at. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, um, in that moment, I felt this, uh, the way that God speaks to me, but, um, I've got folks all over. I've got folks on the bluff and I've got folks, I know mm -hmm. Troy, he's pretty much a rock. I mean, he doesn't have a lot of emotional instability. He doesn't know always what that feels like because mm -hmm. he's just kind of, he's got a real steady. assurance to him. Yep. Yeah, steady. And uh, so I've got folks on the bluff and I've got folks on the floodplain and that has nothing to do with their faith or their identity mm -hmm. in Christ or any of that. Um, and I've actually got folks who wake up every day and they're submerged in and the waters are rising quickly. And would you write about this? Because mm -hmm. some hearts are built on a floodplain and that has nothing to do with their faithfulness or lack of faith or whatever. And so I realized that I had been pretty ashamed about it. And I, I thought, I don't want to write a record about depression. And a lot of that comes from my intersecting with Christian radio because mm -hmm. it was um, safe for the family and uplifting. And, you know, it was meant to be that. And I always felt in that space a little bit, maybe I was too negative. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, well, I'm going to just write about this. So that was the record floodplain my, was my processing really a gift because the floodplain is this beautiful verdant and green space. It has no utility. It's not pragmatic. You can't build on it. It exists to capture the, the river when it overflows its bounds. And I had been going down there since I moved to the Twin Cities, however many, two decades ago. That was my place. I went to the floodplain to pray, to bike, to to go look at those amazing, huge cottonwoods and oaks. So I had, that was a positive place for me. And um, a little bit later, after I wrote the record floodplain, which is all about my journey with anxiety and depression, I, um, a friend of mine who works in what are called riparian zones, that's the scientific term for a floodplain. And he came up to me and he gave me this pamphlet and he said, you won't believe how applicable this is. You've got to read the scientific language about the floodplain. It, it's even the metaphor extends beyond what you've even wow. known. And I opened it up and the very first paragraph says floodplains are riparian zones are the most fragile biome in the world. They're they're swept away. The sand and silt come They're You know, it, they're ever changing. They are the most fragile. The next paragraph said riparian zones are also the most resilient biomes in the world. <laughs> and I thought that is the thing about us sensitive types that we. Again, it's not just a bow, but it, it ebbs and flows, right? There are times when I'm resilient and verdant and green and all kinds of creative things are happening and uh, and then there are other times when the water is rising and I don't have the luxury of bootstrapping here. I have yeah. to call out for a boat. I have to call out for God. I have to call out for friends. I have to activate those signals. Mm -hmm. um, and now I know more about myself. It's not gone away. I've not been healed of that. Um, but I do have, I know myself better now to say, whoa, I'm, these are the markers and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, going past them now and i need to i need to take care of things i need to take care of myself and call out for a boat and i say at that point in my life i called out for a boat and god sent an armada mm -hmm. it was when i finally did sort of tell the truth about it and everything it was just a really beautiful journey of healing mm -hmm. uh, from that point both in my marriage in my parenting in my friendships in my music everything Sorry, Kim, that was a really long. Why would you say sorry? <laughs> that was a master class in, um, you used the words fragility and resiliency. And we like to box those things up separately. Um, and I love it that you paired them and that you are currently pairing them. Yes. Um, and that you said this, the work isn't done the ebbing and the flowing doesn't finish and that that doesn't mean there's something wrong. Actually, that's a, you, that's a beautiful superpower. Maybe when the waters are rising, they don't feel super powery. Um, but man, the way you write about it and sing about it and live it and continue to step in, that is a superpower. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have 15 other questions, but you have to go. 
And I uh, don't want you to faint from hunger after all of this time. So no, I ate to- lunch ahead of time. Okay, I'm good. good job. <laughs> um, I just have a couple questions for you. What do you play and listen to when you're alone? What are the things mm. you reach for over and over? Um, different. I like new, you know, I like my kids are always introducing me to all kinds of new music. Um, mm. And I, I like creativity, fun, you know, inventive people. Maddie Cunningham right now is just blowing my mind. She's so amazing okay. and just won a Grammy for her best folk album. But okay, um, I'm glad to know that name. Yeah, um, Madison Cunningham. And uh, and then Paul Zak is just an incredible, he's my favorite. Um, I mean, Sandra McCracken is my favorite person writing church for, music for the church, but uh, mm. Paul Zak is right on her on her heels and he just wrote a Lent, a Lenten record. Mm. And I got to sing on one of the songs with him. So I was aware of it and um, it is just beautiful, but I don't actually listen to a ton of, I don't listen a lot of music. Um, I I have so much, you know, I I need, now I'm realizing about myself that I need space in, I, I'm a daydreamy kind of, I, that's where I synthesize all the information. So when it looks like I'm just staring out the window, that's when a lot of the work is getting done. I mean, the actual things that will be meaningful later, that's when they're, they're happening. So if I don't allow myself some of that, so driving, I used to always like just radio and listen to music all the time. And now most often when I'm driving, I'm just, I'm just quiet because I feel like we have so much assaulting our senses, you yes. know, at all times. Oh, that's yeah. the truth. And then I'm a reader. I love to read and I love fiction. Um, my last record was based on The Buried Giant by Kazuo Ishiguro. And it's that's a whole long story. Oh, I love but, that. I read a little bit about that and we don't even mm-hmm. have time to go there. But um, I have noticed that you I, I actually missed the days of liner notes. Because I used to read all the words that you yes. write about the words, and now we don't really get those anymore. But I did read that that was a part of your process for the last record. So yeah, um, that actually dovetails beautifully into my final question for you, which is something I ask all of our guests. It's a book nerd question. Oh, and I am one, and I have a feeling that you love. I'm glad you just said it. You love to read too, so it's a two parter. Okay. One, what's a book that you return to over and over in recommending to others? So it could be a very old book. We are such fans of backlist around here Mm -hmm. or a brand new one. What's one that you keep, that keeps popping up in your daydreaming time. And then the second part of the question is what's something you're excited to dig into that might be on your nightstand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, well, I'll, the, the nightstand one's easy because I, well, I've got a stack, of course, uh, Same. up there, but um, I am reading The Water Dancer right now. And uh, I just am like, I want to learn. The first time I read Nora, uh, I'm, I'm totally watching her name, Zora Hurston Neal. Zora Neal Hurston. Zora Neal Hurston. Thank yes. you. Yes. Their eyes were watching God. Yeah, their eyes were watching God. A whole story that had the the white folks in the story were not really anywhere and they weren't there as like sort of evil or good. It was just they right. were benign. They were not centered. Yes. <laughs> to borrow that phrase. And it was such a great experience. And it was like it was un, it was unsettling. And it was the first time yeah. that was that was maybe, you know, a decade ago or so. But it was like um, I had read her in high school and then I came back to it. I'd read yeah. Their Eyes Were Watching God and then reread Their Eyes Were Watching God. So I've tried to lean into that a little mm-hmm. bit. And um, in these just stories that have that are, are yeah, just from to, from different perspectives and things yes. like that. So I'm reading I'm doing a lot of that kind of learning right now. Um, so the water. What did you say? The water. The, dancer? the water dancer. Yeah. The water, water dancer. dancer. OK. Do you yeah. know the author? Tahini you know. Coates. OK. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. I'm saying all these names are wrong. A-T-E-S. I know that yeah, name, but Coates. I have not read of uh, yeah. anything by them yet. Okay, great. We will link to that. Tahanesi Coates. Um, sorry for butchering that name. I should look it up right now. No, um, we will. We'll yes. Tahanesi. I don't, but I also even could look at it and not quite know how to say it. So I yes, should look that up too. I know exactly what you're talking about. You'll say it for me. Okay. You'll okay. say that. Um, and, uh, but this, the book that I recommend, I mean, 
That's so hard. I'm not good at favorites because I'm not good at fa- I'm not good at favorites. So no. Do you have the same uh, problem when people say, what's your favorite album? You cannot any, pick that. It's like picking a or, child. Or movie or no. color, anything. No. It's like, yeah. I don't know. I could make no. a case so, for so many of them. Totally. But. Okay. Well, you are released from the need to say the All right, best I, book ever. The best. Yeah. But yeah, one I recommend one. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Wendell Berry is pretty life-changing yes. for me and okay. Jaber Crow in particular. Um, and Jaber Crow's moment of conversion is maybe one of the best things I've ever read in my okay. life. Okay. I just had so. that book in my hand this weekend and I did not purchase it. So now I'm going back to do oh. that. Okay. I've never read it. Yeah. Okay. I, okay. I learned that way, you know, more less from like people telling me straight on what they've learned. Like you said, here's all the things I've learned and more. I learned through story and fiction. Okay. It, it has a way of renovating my heart mm-hmm. in ways that I can't get at through the front door. <laughs> Oh, good. Renovating your heart. That, that'll, that has legs. That idea has legs. Sarah Gross, I didn't even have time to ask you about the wonderful work you are doing at Art House in St. Paul. We will link to all of those things. I am honored to have your time today and really just so grateful as one of the many in your, I'm not a fan. What did you call me? Listener. Listeners. I am a listener <laughs> and a grateful listener. So thank you for doing what you do, but thank you for doing it the way you do it. Thank so, you. Thank you. It was such a delight to talk with you. And I hope you write a bazillion more songs because I need all of them. Thank you. I'm, I'm aging now, Kim. I'm gonna, well, hurry up. About all I of it. All. <laughs> me too. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me.